And now, cyber war, drone strikes, and very public revelations. Over the past few months, there's been a disturbing stream of articles in the media, and common among them is that they cite leaked, classified, or highly sensitive information. Starting with comments from Senator John McCain on Tuesday, a debate has intensified over recent revelations of national security programs, accounts driven by what appear to be high-level government leaks. One story cited by McCain, published in Friday's New York Times, provided a detailed account, based on mostly anonymous sources, of what was termed America's first sustained use of cyber weapons the so-called Stuxnet program against Iran's nuclear enrichment facilities. Other news reports have looked at secret drone attacks against militants in Yemen and elsewhere, including President Obama's personal role. Senator McCain saw a political motivation behind the revelations. One could draw the conclusion from reading these articles that it is an attempt to further the president's political ambitions for the sake of his re-election. Yesterday, White House Press Secretary Jay Carney responded, saying any suggestion that this administration has authorized intentional leaks of classified information for political gain is grossly irresponsible. But there were bipartisan Senate concerns expressed today by top members of the Senate and House Intelligence Committees, who said they would push for tougher legislation to crack down on the leaks. This has to stop. When people say they don't want to work with the United States because they can't trust us to keep a secret, that's serious. It put lives in danger and it infringes upon the ability of the intelligence community to do their job. Friday's New York Times article was in fact adapted from a new book titled Confront and Conceal, Obama's Secret Wars and Surprising Use of American Power. Its author, David Sanger, is chief Washington correspondent for the paper. And David Sanger joins us now. David, the, the cyber weapon attack on Iran was codenamed Olympic Games, right? That's it right. started under President Bush, but ramped up under President Obama. And you referred to it as a far more sophisticated attack than ever before. In what, in what way? Well, several ways, Jeff. Uh, first, the code itself was very large. But secondly, this is not the usual cyber attack of one, my computer attacks your laptop or you go after an ATM machine or Visa's, uh, you know, subscriber list. This was an attack that went through the computer system that is in the Natanz enrichment plant where they make nuclear fuel that's walled off from the Internet. So they had to get it over basically an electronic moat. Mm -hmm. And then it went in and attacked the actual centrifuges, speeding them up, slowing them down, and ultimately making many of them blow up, all the while sending signals to the Iranian control room that everything was operating normally. Now, up to this point, we had thought, we had always talked about this as an Israeli operation, for the, well, at least speculation, right? So you're, you're, you're suggesting that you're laying out the details here about how this was originally a U.S. operation. It was the U.S. and the Israelis together, and we ran a story in January of 2010 that said as much, that mm -hmm. said that looking at this code and from the reporting we did, we believed it had been a U.S.-Israeli operation. What I did as I started working on Confront and Conceal was pull on that string to figure out what had happened. And really, the big revelation here, the, the first big break in the story, wasn't anybody talking about it. It was the escape of this computer code, this computer virus. When you say escape, you mean it literally. Es literally, sort of it escaped from the Natanz plant. It was supposed to stay inside Natanz. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, there were repeated attacks engineered in Washington, in, uh, in, uh, in Israel. They brought a new version in. It had a slight flaw in it. We've all gotten software over the years that needed a little bit of more work. And this one leapt aboard the laptop computer of an Iranian engineer who was just working inside the plant doing maintenance work. He goes home, he plugs into the internet, it starts propagating around the world. And suddenly everyone, including the Iranians, realized that this was a cyber code attack. And so the Iranians maybe for the first few years thought their equipment was just failing. They had bought some pretty bad design. Now they realize the truth. Now, when you put this into the larger perspective with the drone attacks, how much 
just debate was there inside the White House? How much uh, attempt at a legal justification or, or a debate over the effectiveness of these things? Because as you write about, this is what makes it so interesting, this is particularly with cyber weaponry, it's sort of like the early days of nuclear weapons, right? Yeah. Everybody's trying to figure out where the boundaries are and what's effective. It is, and that's the fascinating part of this debate. You know, in nuclear weapons, it took us, what, 20 years to come up with some rules about when they would and wouldn't be used. Remember, MacArthur wanted to use them in mm -hmm. Korea. Mm -hmm. There was debate about using them during the Cuban Missile Crisis 50 years ago this year. Uh, in the drones debate, there's been debate for 10 years about when it's the right time to do drone attacks, and we're still having that debate. In cyber, it has not been a public debate, but it's now becoming one. President Obama, sitting in the Situation Room, getting briefed on these attacks, was very concerned about whether or not there would be collateral damage, whether you'd be shutting down hospitals, for example. Uh, he was quite concerned about whether or not countries might use the fact that the United States is using cyber weaponry to attack back at the U.S. But in, in fact, you, I mean, that's very interesting because you quote people as being concerned about whether you're offering a justification for others to use it. That's right. That's right. Now, many said to me, you know, the Chinese, the Russians, they figured out by now that we have cyber weapons, and they figured it out because mm -hmm. Stuxnet uh, uh, escaped. But these debates took place. But we're at the very infancy. You know, we're sort of at that same equivalent moment as of 1945 to 49 mm -hmm. when we were figuring out nuclear. We're at that same moment right now with cyber. So your revelations and, and, and other recent stories that have come out have, as we've seen, stirred up a lot of debate and controversy and even some anger. Do you, do you, do you think that the revelations such as this uh, are putting people at risk? Well, it's always a very big concern, particularly at the New York Times. We deal with a lot of national security stories every month. We are fairly experienced at how to go do this. We dealt with, for example, with WikiLeaks, which was, you know, thousands of secret documents. So I did, in this case, with the newspaper's understanding, uh, exactly what we do in the others. We went to the government, we explained the outlines of the story, and we said, if there are details here that affect operational uh, events, could put somebody's life at risk, let's discuss it and we'll uh, see what we can do to, to uh, make sure those don't get into print. You're confident about that. And we had, we had those discussions. And in the end, uh, I deleted, as I say uh, in a note on sources at the end of the book, I deleted some technical details that they asked. Everything they asked to be deleted, we deleted. What about uh, addressing uh, Senator McCain's other point, which, of course, is, again, something you have to deal with all the time, that in some ways you run the risk of being used by, uh, in this case, it would be the White House, for political reasons. The articles make it seem as though President Obama is... Very much involved, right? Mm -hmm. Very active. A strong leader. Right. Um, Jeff, I can just tell you what my experience was in reporting this. This was an 18-month-long process because the Stuxnet worm first made its way out in 2010. I was doing this as part of a much larger look at the Obama national security policy, which is really what most of the book uh, is about, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, uh, China, and so forth. And I reported this from the bottom up. So, uh, you know, you hear the word leaks. It really doesn't do justice to the process of piecing things together out in the old-fashioned way of, of doing reporting. And but, but, but you are quoting people who are inside these meetings. That, so. th that, that's right. But that, you know, by and large comes only after you've put together the essence of, of the meeting, uh, the essence of, of the story. And uh, that's, uh, you know, that there's an important public policy purpose that is served for this. People aren't just publishing stories like this because these are cool revelations. They're publishing it because it meets the test of a subject matter that the American people have to debate how you want to go use these weapons, whether it's drones, whether it's cyber, whether it's special forces. These are the biggest decisions the United States has to make as it presents a new face to the world. And the trick is, can you do that without endangering lives? All right. The new book is Confront and Conceal. David Sanger of The New York Times. Thanks so much. Thank you.